Okay, um, without further ado, I will start my presentation. Okay, so uh, hello everyone, a very good afternoon to uh, all of you. And uh, thank you for joining me here today. So I'm uh, Jin Rong. Okay, today I'll be talking about some uh, key issues, okay, that may impact the election. Okay, uh, my anal analysis on uh, who will win the election. And finally, I'll have some uh, sector recommendations that uh, you may wish to look out for. Okay, um, before I begin proper, uh, I guess we all know actually what happened uh, yesterday, right? So maybe I just give you a very brief uh, overview of what I think uh, of the market. So actually my personal take on the market is that, you know, uh, near term wise, I believe that there will still be a flock to uh, safe haven access. Okay, because uh, there will be panic selling and we are still dealing with a lot of uh, uncertainties. Okay, so it may be good to take a risk off approach for now. Okay, with all this uh, volatility. Okay, however, I believe that, you know, uh, do be patient because as we await more clarity on all this uh, uncertainty, okay, I believe that once, you know, once we get past all this uncertainty, market will stabilize, it may actually present uh, opportunities uh, to accumulate, okay, because some of this uh, overreaction uh, will then be uh, sort of discounted. Okay, so um, here are some of the uncertainty that uh, we are all dealing with, okay and uh, my personal thoughts on them. Okay, so I believe that uh, a delayed election is unlikely, okay, because the uh, election date is actually set by law. Okay, so I do see little chance of a uh, postponement. Okay, so I guess election will, will proceed as usual. Okay, of course, uh, if you're talking about disruption in economic activities, right, I do think that it will have a minimal impact. Okay, because Trump will continue uh, on his duties, okay, and also, uh, day-to-day -day operation for government will also continue with all these uh, contingency uh, plan in place. Okay, and then vo voters' uh, attention for future uh, presidential debate, okay, will turn to the vice president uh, one instead, okay, which will be set for uh, 7 October, which I believe is actually a positive for Trump campaign, because I think that, you know, uh, Pence is better able to uh, hold a fort during debate. Okay, some other uncertainty. Okay, uh, currently, you know, contact tracing is underway. Okay, I look at uh, Trump's uh, public schedule. Okay, it shows that he did, he did not meet with any uh, political leaders lately. So that's a good thing, at least for, for other uh, economies. Okay, but his uh, internal cabinet may be facing some spread already. Okay, so uh, just yesterday and today, we have been receiving, you know, news of uh, more and more of his... Uh, of his cabinet getting the test, tested positive for the virus itself. Okay, but I think a more important risk will of course be the, the stimulus deal, right? Okay, we see uh, Pelosi trying to push for a standalone uh, airline aid. Okay, but that actually fell uh, apart yesterday. Okay, and personally, I believe that there could still be a slight delay in stimulus. Okay, because I'm actually uh, quite wary on whether, you know, a physical meeting can actually uh, take place. Okay, while well, this, you know, contact tracing process uh, is still ongoing. Okay, so I think that it will only take place when this process is uh, completed and we can identify, you know, who actually has the disease and who is, uh, in a way, uh, safe. Okay, and of course, uh, older members from the House and Senate, they may be more concerned, okay, to meet to vote until uh, things have stabilized. Okay, uh, but a positive factor from this is that, you know, Democrats can use this case to highlight Okay, highlight the severity of COVID and try to push for their uh, more comprehensive view, which I think this is the approach that they are trying to look out for now. Okay, the most extreme uh, scenario, of course, many people are worried that, you know, his conditions will worsen over the next two weeks. Um, I believe that day-to-day -day, uh, government operations will have minimal impact, okay, because they actually have all this uh, contingency uh, plan in place. Okay, pens will take over and uh, pens will actually been tested uh, negative already. Okay, but the real impact will come for the upcoming election. Okay, because if his condition were to worsen over the next two weeks, okay, we may be looking at a swapping of a Republican presidential candidate. Okay, of course, it is hard to determine now. We do not know how his condition will actually uh, play out. So this one, we actually have to play by year and see, actually see how it goes. Okay, for larger downside risk, I mean, we got over one of it uh, last night, I mean, which will be the case of a Biden contracting the virus, right? 
Okay, but later update is that you know he tested a negative for the virus. Okay, and also um the higher the more macroeconomic risk will be that you know it's speculated that the the close eight actually contracted the virus from a campaign supporter. Okay, so if you look at all these kind of in-person uh, campaign, right, they tend to be super spreader event. Okay, and in this case, if they were to con contract it from uh, the campaign, right, it actually highlights a greater issue. Okay, it may actually serve as a wake-up call for the US community, okay, that the virus spread will continue. Okay, and what I'm worried about is that, you know, with uh, this wake-up call, right, um, governors may, may actually think twice Okay, before trying to proceed with a further economic reopening plan. Okay, so that could be a potential risk because it may actually hinder uh, or maybe slow down the pace of uh, economic progress. Okay, um, as we can see, uh, sentiments have actually largely swing towards a Biden victory, okay, based on yesterday news. Okay, why is it because uh, if you look at Trump approach to rally supporters, right, it's actually through uh, in-person campaign. Okay, he like to meet up with his uh, voters. Okay, and based on his campaign schedule, okay, the next few campaignings, you know, these few days will actually be in uh, Florida, will be in uh, Wisconsin, will be in Arizona. So all of these will actually have to be cut off uh, currently. So these are actually very key uh, battleground states. Okay, that Trump will actually need to secure, okay, in order to win the election. Okay, later I'll, 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 I'll show you a, a scenario, okay, on why, why I think, you know, uh, all these swing states are very important for him. Okay. Okay, so um, moving on, okay, I, I think that currently his chance of a re-election has been uh, greatly reduced, okay, because, you know, sentiments for swing voters, they may look towards Trump as being uh, incompetent to contain the virus, okay, because he has always been playing down the COVID situation uh, uh, previously, okay. And a small point there is that I think sympathy votes for him is uh, unlikely, lah, okay, or even if there is, okay, it, it, it should have a very minimal impact. Okay, so now uh, after Trump, we can take a step back and actually look at the larger uh, picture itself. Okay, um, why is because there was a survey done in August, okay, whereby 62% uh, of voters, okay, they actually mentioned that the virus outbreak will be an important factor, okay, in their decision about who to support, okay, in the election. Okay, now we are just a few weeks away, okay, we can see that, you know, uh, COVID cases in the US have actually started to pick up, okay, that accompanied with this uh, Trump's uh, situation, right, okay, if this uh, COVID uh, resurgence, uh, really get out of hand over the next month, okay, of course, uh, we'll be looking at, you know, more voting support may actually flow over to Biden. Okay, so the, here is the list of uh, states with the highest increase in the new cases, okay, over the, the past seven days, okay, we can just focus on the three uh, highlighted states, okay, which saw significant increase in uh, cases, okay, we look at Michigan, we look at North Carolina, we look at uh, Wisconsin, Okay, as usual, they are deemed to be a uh, key battleground states, okay, which means that their votes can swing to either party. So it's important for, for either party to actually, you know, secure uh, these states to be elected. Okay, uh, Michigan and Wisconsin, they used to be prone uh, Democrats. Okay, but in 2016, you know, Trump managed to win it over. Okay, even though it's just uh, marginally, okay, by uh, 0 0.3 to 0.7%. Uh, Okay, um, vaccine, yes, uh, we are getting closer and closer to a vaccine with uh, 11 candidates, okay, actually currently qualifying for uh, phase three testing. Okay, now with Trump uh, having the disease, okay, I believe that Trump will actually use his uh, personal experience to push uh, for a vaccine rollout. Okay, we know that uh, he has actually been uh, trying this uh, unapproved uh, vaccine from uh, Regeneron, right? And if he can really show that it works, Okay, I think it will be a large uh, positive for his campaign because it, in a way it helps to boost uh, sentiments that there is actually already a viable uh, vaccine and that will subsequently, you know, uh, roll over to, to all these uh, economic reopening plans. Okay, but if we just look at the standard uh, procedure, right, to have a, actually have a very mass uh, rollout, 
okay, in terms of making this vaccine uh, readily available, right, there's actually a process that we need to go through. Okay, first we need to have this initial uh, test results, which will be used for approval, okay, for emergency use only. Okay, thereafter, then it will actually take another six months for, for a company to actually collate the full uh, trial results before approval for public use can be made. Okay, so this is the, the, the standard procedure. Okay, I'm not too sure whether you know they will lack this uh lack this uh criteria if you know uh, Trump really show that uh the, the vaccine that he has been using is actually having a, a positive effect. Okay, but this is just the, the just uh information for you in case of the of the standard uh, procedure. Okay, another thing is that the next issue at hand, okay, US China relationship. Okay, I believe that Trump will use his uh, you know, personal contraction of COVID to actually rally uh, uh, sentiments against China. Okay, why? It's because if you look at the chart here, okay, since uh, Trump's term as uh, president, okay, actually negative views towards uh, China among the US population has surged. Okay, and this is the reason why if, if we listen to both uh, parties' campaign speech, both parties do not want to appear as being too soft on China. Because this is the exact reason they know that they will lose a lot of voting support here. Okay, so in terms of Trump campaigning, I believe that this will be one of the direction that he will take. Okay, in order to try to salvage uh, his votes at the moment. Okay, but ultimately, um, if you think of the bigger picture and longer term, right, the stance to actually decouple from China um, is actually a very difficult process. Okay, because China is the US the largest supplier of a, of a goods import. Okay, so we can see that you know close to two years even after the trade war, okay, the trade imbalance is still it still remains high, okay, at 2013 level. So uh, we may if US wants to really bring this uh, trade imbalance figure down, okay, we may actually expect more uh, damaging policies to follow. So this is this may be one of the key risks that uh, market may look out for, okay, in the longer term. Okay, of course, the next issue that is of focus, okay, will be the pace of economic recovery, right? That will determine, you know, uh, the outcome of the election. Why? It's because if you look at historical data, okay, during years of election where there is also a recession, okay, we see that there tends to be a party change. Okay, logically, if you think of it, it will actually make sense, right? Because people are, are suffering, okay, they may demand for change. Okay, we can actually see this from our, our own Singapore election. Okay, whereby the, the voting of approval actually, actually uh, see a decrease, see a decline. Okay, so out of uh, seven election years with a recession, okay, there are only two years where the incumbent managed to hold his ground with a recession. Okay, one is in 1924, okay, where the recession ended a few months uh, uh, before the election. Another is in 1948, okay, where the recession only start in November after the election. So whether these two you want to put into this statistic, it, it remains a, a debatable. Okay, but the point that I'm trying to show is that you know ultimately economic recovery is actually crucial uh, for Trump. Okay, to actually improve his uh, approval ratings. Okay, I believe our current economic recovery is uh, underway. Okay, for Q3 2020, we may be seeing a strong rebound. But of course, I mean, this is considering that we actually start off from a very low base, okay, when the economy was uh, mostly shut down in Q2. Okay, but generally, you know, sentiments on, uh, on this uh, job security and economy outlook will continue to improve. Okay, and we, we have seen it reflected in the, in the poll approval rating for Trump, okay, whereby it actually increased steadily since July, okay, before, I mean, uh, before the news that he got COVID and then it, it actually have a plunge there. Okay, so in line is that, you know, economic growth will, will be important uh, to gain uh, supporters. Okay, uh, just in yesterday, okay, unemployment rate, okay, um, huge improvement from the recent peak, currently at 7.9%. Okay, now we are, we are trending below the peak of the 2009 uh, financial crisis. Okay, from another perspective, Okay, latest figure for payroll. Okay, we see that the labor market has actually recovered more than half of the job loss. Okay, but the problem will come in terms of the next half of the journey. Okay, which I believe will be a more uh, challenging one. Okay, because we can see that recovery has actually uh, uh, started to taper down. 
okay, over the recent uh, few months, especially, you know, for now we are dealing with the absence of a steam, uh, fiscal stimulus itself. Okay, why economic recovery is important? Because the labor market recovery currently remains an uh, imbalance. Okay, some states are progressing uh, better than the others. Okay, there are still some states where we see unemployment rates actually above uh, 10%. Okay, of course, if you look at their voting trend, right, most of these states have a uh, voting trend of leaning towards the Democrat. So, uh, so I will just, uh, I will assume that, you know, they will, they will just uh, stay on with their, with their loyalty towards Democrat. But the key state that we should look out for is uh, Pennsylvania. Okay, back in 2016, uh, Trump won Pennsylvania by a very narrow margin of just 0.7%. So this time around, he is going to have a very hard time securing this state especially if we are talking about, you know, 10.3% uh, unemployment rate. Okay, so out of 10 people, they actually have one, uh, one uh, person who is actually uh, doesn't have a job. Okay, so these are all the key issues. Okay, now I'll show you my analysis on why I think a Biden win is, of course, you know, uh, likely. Okay, but this is based on a deduction from their, from their path to a victory. Okay, first, uh, I single out all these lists of uh, potential swing states. Okay, so these are states whereby, you know, uh, the winning party just win by a very marginal lead in 2016. Or maybe their lead in 2016, right, has actually dropped very significantly compared to the uh, past uh, average five elections. Okay, so it will definitely be crucial to win over these states, especially if you look at uh, states like, you know, Florida and Pennsylvania, they actually carry, uh, you know, a huge amount of uh, electoral votes. Okay, so this is the base scenario I established. Okay, of course, the brown colored states will be the swing state, which I mentioned uh, on the previous slide on the table. Okay, the other colored states, right, uh, I actually look at their voting history, their, their average margin lead, okay, their approval rating, and also uh, their 2016 uh, results. Okay, so uh, the other colored states, you know, they have a tendency to lean towards a particular party. Okay, so uh, I will leave it as that. Okay, but for now, if you just look at the swing state itself, okay, out of all the eight uh, swing state that is listed, okay, we can see that Biden just have to secure, you know, between two to four swing states to win the election. Okay, if he, if we are talking about, you know, a very narrow win, okay, he just need to secure a minimum of two. Okay, and we look at the total combination, okay, for him to achieve victory, there is a total of 41 scenarios. Okay, we can think of it as a 41 uh, path that he can take. So he, he actually has more uh, flexibility to play around with. Okay, as compared to Trump, okay, his situation, okay, even without him contracting the virus, his situation is already more challenging. Okay, uh, back in 2016, he won the election uh, by securing actually seven out of the eight current swing states. Okay, and having a very marginal lead in uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Okay, so to really achieve a victory, he actually need to basically pull off whatever he did in 2016. It's harder for him, okay, because if you just if we are just talking about a narrow win, okay, even the narrowest win, he need to win a minimum of four out of the eight uh, swing states. Okay, and if you look at the total combination for his path to victory. Okay, there's only uh, uh, 32 uh, scenarios. Okay, but if you do a deeper uh, analysis, you can see that ultimately the whole election revolves around uh, the state of Florida. Okay, why is because, um, yes, just by looking at the number of combinations, you know, Biden has an upper hand, right? He has more uh, leeway and flexibility to play around with. Okay, but for the state of Florida, I mean, if you all, if you all do not wish to, to stay up for the final results, right? I mean, you all can just uh, uh, look out for the results of, of Florida. Okay, uh, why is because if in the event where Trump actually loses of Florida, okay, he finds himself having to win at least six out of the remaining seven states in order to have a win. Okay, and the number of routes that he can take, actually, there's just six paths that he can take. Okay, but in case in, in the event of a uh, Biden, okay, he has more room to play around with. Okay, if he loses Florida, okay, he can still look to secure uh, three or four of the other states. Okay, so in a way, uh, the state of Florida could be like uh, in a life and death uh, scenario for Trump itself. 
Okay, but this election is a bit different. Uh, it's very different actually. Okay, why? Okay, for Trump, where the tide could actually turn will be in terms of absentee uh, ballots. So this is a, a key debate that, that they, they are trying to iron out, right? Because due to COVID, okay, we are actually seeing a huge surge in the mail ballots this election. Okay, it's actually almost half of the total uh, registered voters back in 2016. Okay, so what we are, what we may be dealing with is that there will be more room for uh, electoral uh, dispute. Okay, some instances, you know, uh, for example, will be like, what if, you know, the, they mail out the ballot, but it's unable to reach in time to be counted. Okay, that, that could be one uh, uh, electoral uh, dispute scenario. Okay, and uh, if you are really looking at the risk of a delay, okay, or a contested result, Okay, I think that we need to be cautious. Okay, why? Because back in 2000 election, okay, there was also a similar case whereby we are dealing with uh, a delayed election. So at that time, it actually took five weeks, okay, to settle the results between uh, Bush and Elgo at that time. Okay, and what we see during that five, five weeks, right, during that period, the S&P 500 actually fell 12%, okay, fell 12% from the election day to the late December low while waiting, you know, for the results to, to be finalized. Okay, because of all this uh, uncertainty, right? So this time round, my personal take is that, you know, if we are looking at the risk of another delayed election, okay, we may also see a similar case. Okay, market may undergo a correction. Okay, especially now we are, we are, we are in, at a critical stage of uh, economic recovery from COVID, right? If you cannot, you know, if you cannot come to a, a a final results, right? We are looking at, you know, uh, probably a potential delay in further stimulus uh, from the government, for example. So that will be actually a huge uh, risk of uh, downside in the market. Okay, this is uh, just another perspective. Okay, the highlighted states are the swing states. Okay, so, so we can see a very huge surge in terms of absentee ballot requests. Okay, especially in, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania itself. Okay, why this is worrying, okay, is because we see a tendency, okay, whereby Democrats are actually more likely than uh, Republicans to vote by mail, okay, while most Republicans, they are more likely to vote in person, okay, so this could be one of the reasons why, you know, Trump has been very strongly against mail voting, because if you were to accept mail voting, is actually to his uh, disadvantage, he's actually accepting more of, uh, of a Democrat's uh, vote. Okay, so um, the scenario of election day, I believe that it will be an early Republican lead because they will count all the in-person votes first. Okay, thereafter the absentee votes which will come in later will then show uh, Democrats are uh, gaining ground. Okay, but of course the key issue here is that, you know, with all these uh, Democrat votes that is coming in later, okay, how many of them, uh, you know, can actually be, be uh, uh, counted in time in a sense, okay? So, I mean, if you are looking at uh, any delay in terms of this mailing of, uh, of uh, mail, mail voting, right, it's actually to the disadvantage of the Democrats, okay, and there is actually a risk that uh, some of these votes may not be counted, okay, even though uh, there could be a potential scenario whereby majority, you know, actually, actually voted for, for Democrats, but because of this, all this delay, okay, some of these votes uh, may not be counted. So ultimately, there, will, there is still a lot of uncertainty and a potential uh, dispute. Okay, there is actually a revolving around this space. Okay, just a very brief uh, scenario analysis. Okay, the odds here uh, has not been uh, updated to reflect the, the news yesterday. Okay, because the odds are, are not out yet, you know, because there's still a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Okay, people are still waiting on a uh, greater clarity. Okay, but you know, before Trump actually uh, contract uh, COVID, right? Uh, the highest odds is actually of a blue wave. Okay, 35% uh, occurrence. Okay, uh, I believe that with this uh, COVID, probably the, the, prob the probability may actually swing uh, higher, okay, towards uh, a blue wave itself. Okay, because even before that, we are actually seeing a, a greater uh, betting odds for a blue wave. Okay, um, some people may think that, you know, a democratic president may be bad for the market. Okay, of course, if you are looking at uh, 
imposing more regulations, we are looking at a potential uh, tax increase. Okay. Uh, however, historically, okay, if you look at the returns uh, based on the different scenarios, okay, uh, market performance under a democratic precedence are uh, actually tend to lead to a higher uh, market returns than a Republican uh, president, be it under an event of a unified or under a, a split Congress. Okay, so if you are looking at a blue wave scenario, it historically posts an annual return of uh, around 12%, okay, which is higher than the average return of uh, all years, okay, 11.6%. Uh, okay, so one key reason could be, okay, could be because of uh, both political party stance towards a uh, policy choice. Okay, as we know, the Republican, they tend to prefer uh, tax cuts. Okay, which may actually have a lower fiscal multiplier. Okay, but why they prefer that is because it's actually more popular with the people. Okay, whereas the Democrats, they prefer to go for uh, infrastructure spending and uh, redistribution uh, policies, as you can see from him wanting to, to uh, impose higher tax on the wealthy. Okay, but all these policies will actually carry a higher uh, fiscal uh, multiplier. Okay, so this can be in a way supported Okay, historically, if you look at uh, US real GDP growth under a democratic president, it averaged out to be around 4.26%. Okay, whereas uh, annual real GDP growth under a Republican president averaged to be around 2.3%. Uh, okay, uh, before I move on, okay, so yeah, here's the table of the estimated uh, fiscal multiplier of the different policies. So what, the, what this means is that, for example, if we look at our tax cut, okay, it means that a 1% decrease in tax will boost the economic growth by around 0.3 to 0.4%. Okay, so it's actually quite a low uh, multiplier right there. Okay, for a Biden presidency, okay, of course he may have proposed a uh, tax increase and uh, having more regulation, right? Okay, however, I believe that, you know, he also actually proposed a very bold uh, fiscal stimulus plan, okay, over the next four years. So if we were to consider this fiscal stimulus, okay, and also his more uh, predictable approach on the trade front, and also when we are looking at, you know, a stronger economic recovery next year, okay, in an in a optimistic event of us having a, a viable vaccine, Okay, I believe that it actually helps to offset uh, much of the negative impact on the business sentiment uh, from his tax and regulation policies. Okay, and when he imposed all these, you know, uh, tax and regulation, I mean, uh, they will have to look at the economy, right? I mean, if the economy is in bad shape, okay, you can, I mean, they may, okay, potentially just put it off. Okay, no point trying to impose when, when uh, the economy, uh, which, no, no point imposing. Okay, when the economic progress uh, will be hindered in that sense. So there's still some discretion uh, right there. Okay, of course, if you are looking at a split Congress, okay, his fiscal plan may actually be met with some resistance. Okay, but we may still be looking at a reduced, uh, reduced budget. Okay, but overall, I feel that there will be an offsetting effect. Okay, and if there is really an overreaction in the market, Okay, I believe that it can be a, actually a good opportunity to, to accumulate going into next year. Okay. So for Trump, it will be more of a status quo. Okay, I mean, uh, the tax cut which he proposed back in 2017 is actually set to expire uh, at the end of 2025. So uh, he, we may be seeing an extension of that. Okay, and when we talk about Trump, okay, we are referring to more deregulation, okay. And he also have a potential uh, fiscal stimulus, okay, on transportation and uh, 5G, 5G infrastructure, okay. Uh, he may also offer tax credit to U.S. companies that that uh, relocate their manufacturing facilities back from China. So generally, for Trump, it will be uh, positive for the economy, okay. But one key risk for him will of course be his unpredictable stance on trade, and especially on China. Okay, and especially now, you know, he contract a disease, he can actually use this, uh, if, he, if he were to be re-elected, he can actually use this uh, case to actually further propel his, uh, his uh, stance, his hard stance on China. 
Okay, so I guess this may be what uh, everyone has been waiting for, right? Okay, sector uh, recommendation. Okay, this is just a, a this may be the key uh, takeaway. Okay, for the overview of uh, of uh, sectors. Okay, why I include the the some other portion like fundamentals, right? Is because I believe that you know uh, investors they probably should not jump in purely based on the U.S. election policy itself. Okay, why? Because there's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of whether, you know, they propose these policies, but whether it can really actually be passed. Okay, and of course, if you are looking at the timeline, right, like if you're looking at Biden's uh, fiscal stimulus, he actually plans to spread it out over the next four years. Okay, so the timeline is still very unclear, okay, on when we will actually see an uh, actual uh, positive impact of the policy itself, okay, in terms of the economy and in terms of the, the corporate. Okay, so I believe that there is definitely a need to consider uh, other factors like uh, fundamentals, okay, be it in terms of uh, macroeconomic factors or, you know, sector growth outlook away from the election itself. Okay, and that is why I include the, the fundamental columns there. Okay, uh, under the valuation column, okay, I look at the individual sectors uh, forward PE, forward PB and uh, PS ratio. Okay, and then I compare it to its uh, historical average. So if you see a plus sign, I mean, it means that the sector may be undervalued now in terms of, uh, of its uh, potential growth. Okay, and then a minus sign means that a sector, you know, could be uh, overvalued. Okay, so under the relative strength column, okay, I look at the sector uh, momentum, okay, in terms of its uh, price performance relative to the, to the market and also the percentage of counters that is above its 50-day uh, moving average and a 200-day moving average. Okay, so a uh, relative strength is basically just a rough gauge, okay, to, for a short-term uh, rough gauge to determine if a sector is actually leading or lagging behind the, the overall market. So uh, a plus sign means that, you know, the sector is leading uh, the market performance in the short term. Okay, a, mini, a minus sign means that a sector uh, could be lagging, okay, in terms of a, a momentum point of view. So relative strength, I would say, is more short term. Okay, in terms of valuation, uh, it could be a longer term play because we do not know uh, when market, uh, how long market will take to actually, you know, uh, realize its uh, value itself. Okay, um, and lastly, I did not include all 11 sectors here, okay, because uh, probably you all have to stay past uh, dinner in that, in that sense. Okay, I only single out those sectors which I feel may be more uh, prominent okay, for the upcoming uh, US election. Okay, so we will start off with the energy sector. Okay, for longer term fundamentals, uh, we have uh, seen I mean, oil production cuts and demand stabilizing as economies uh, start to reopen. Okay, and there has also been a shift, uh, but there has also been a shift towards clean energy. Okay, that has already started to play out over, uh, over the past historical years. Because if you were to look at the amount of renewable uh, investment flow, okay, it has, actually in, it has actually increased over the years. Okay, so if Biden were to, were to get elected, right, the trend will continue, but Biden will definitely you know, accelerate uh, uh, this trend in a way. Okay, but however, I still overall, I remain neutral. Okay, if there's no plus and minus, it means that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm neutral about this. Okay, why is because I think there is still uncertainty on uh, when the oil market can actually find a new equilibrium in terms of uh, supply and demand. There's still a lot of uncertainty. And especially now, if you are, we are looking at virus resurgence in some parts of the world, um, there may be an impact in terms of uh, economic uh, recovery. Okay, so uh, in a way, I, I, I would prefer to, to watch out for more clarity. Okay, so for the US election, we know Biden, he has a green agenda, right? And that is actually one of his uh, dominant uh, spending policy to build out our uh, energy efficient uh, infrastructure. Okay, he has a very bold mission. Okay, he hope US uh, will achieve 100% clean energy and net zero emission uh, no later by 2050. Uh, whether that can be done, I, I have my thoughts on that. I do not think it can be achieved, uh, but never mind. I mean, uh, so we can expect Biden to actually impose a tougher climate change, uh, tougher, tougher climate rules, okay? 
But for Trump, okay, he will actually take the far opposite stance. So under his term, we have seen that he actually pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. He has uh, rolled back our uh, limits on uh, methane emission. Okay, he wants to expand more parts of the sea for, for offshore drilling. Okay, so we can see that his approach is generally, uh, he favors deregulation and will definitely be positive for the energy sector okay, if he were to be uh, re-elected. Okay, so uh, here's a list of uh, ETF uh, which you may look out for. Okay, for clean energy, uh, we do see very familiar name. I'm, I'm sure we all know Tesla, right? Okay, and for dirty energy play in, in a sense, I call it dirty energy. Okay, we see uh, Exxon Mobil and, uh, and a Chevron. Okay, so these are just some uh, ETF that, that you may want to look out for. Okay, um, in terms of Tesla, okay, um, revenue and operating income uh, is expected to, to pick up pace over the next two years. Okay, a uh, positive catalyst will be its uh, Model 3 and Model Y delivery, okay, boosting its uh, top line. Okay, it also maintains its target of, you know, vehicle deliveries for full year 2020, okay, which actually represents a 36% increase for, from uh, last year. Okay, but uh, currently whether this, um, whether this target can be achieved, it remains uh, highly uncertain. Okay, but that is, for currently that is their stance okay, towards their, their financial performance moving forward. Okay, and also we are looking, if you are looking at it's Berlin's uh, Giga Factory, okay, it's start, starting to start production in uh, mid-2021, okay, which will in a way underpin its uh, European uh, expansion plan. Okay, however, the issue with Tesla, we all know, is always its uh, valuation, right? Okay, for example, if you just look at its uh, EV to, to EBITDA, it's actually at 78.6, okay, while the industry average is only at uh, 29. So we can see that there is a lot of growth uh, and uh, growth expectation, okay, being factored into the share price itself, okay. And also uh, Tesla now is still, I would say, is still under the growth phase. So every quarter they tend to incur high R&D costs, okay, high capex, because they are investing uh, heavily to increase its uh, production capacity and of course enhance its uh, supercharger uh, infrastructure. Okay, but nevertheless, uh, it remains a stock with high growth potential okay, and may stand to benefit uh, directly uh, from a Biden uh, win itself. Okay, if you were to look at the table, uh, the table under analyst uh, coverage, okay, it's, it's actually a compilation of the different uh, research house rating. So this is just to give you an overall feel of uh, sentiments on the ground itself. Okay, the target price you see is actually the consensus 12-month target price of various analysts over at the US side. Okay, and uh, these data are from Bloomberg. So um, based on views, uh, there's actually a very wide polarity for Tesla. Okay, in terms of the target price, there's also, you know, there are, there are, there are some which is very bullish and some which is uh, fall on the other spectrum, which is uh, very uh, bearish in a way. Yeah, but generally, yes, uh, Tesla will, will, be, will benefit uh, directly under uh, Biden win itself. Okay, for Trump win, of course, we look at a stable company, right? Okay, we, we can look at uh, ExxonMobil as, uh, in a way, a dirty energy play. Okay, but um, if you look at its financials, uh, yes, uh, it has been dragged down by COVID this year. And will actually take more than the next two years to recover back to uh, pre-COVID levels. Okay, a uh, positive catalyst is that, um, yes, to cope with the impact from COVID, okay, they are actually taking steps to cut their expenses, okay, they are taking steps to cut their, their capital spending, okay, in a way to, to sustain, uh, sustain their margin itself, okay. And a good thing is that, you know, even though it's downgraded, they still earn an uh, investment grade credit rating from Moody's. Okay, which suggests that, um, you know, yes, uh, they, they, are, they may be able to fulfill uh, its uh, financial obligations in the short term. Okay, and a uh, further downside risk will, of course, uh, include a slower than expected uh, economic recovery. And of course, a resurgence of virus case that may, that may cause uh, more uh, mobility restrictions. Okay, but from a valuation standpoint, okay, if we look at the valuation, um, I believe that a lot of bad news has already been uh, factored into the, the share price. 
Okay, I believe that you know once we get past uh, the election after all these uh, uncertainties, right? Okay, uh, I believe that much of the bad news uh, may in fact be discounted. Okay, and the uh, energy sector could see a, a rebound in a sense based on the valuation uh, point of view. Okay, for the financial sector, okay, uh, fundamentals is that stress test conducted by the Fed. Okay, it reinforced uh, that you know the banking sectors is able to better weather the storm uh, this time around. Okay, we are looking at more scrutiny. Okay, the Fed has actually imposed a new capital requirements for individual large banks. Okay, and we can see, we see that you know most banks are able to fulfill it. Okay, uh, but ultimately, uh, surge in uh, loans default. Okay, weak weak loan growth uh, moving forward may actually lead to downward revision in uh, earnings expectation. Okay, but same thing, I believe that you know negativity may have been uh, factored into uh, the valuation. Okay, if you are looking ahead, okay, economic recovery will continue. Okay, and we are getting uh, closer and closer to a viable vaccine, I hope. Okay, so this sector is by and large, I believe, is more of a playing a waiting game in a sense. Okay, so for the US elections, um, Biden wants to push for more regulations. Okay, he wants to crack down on uh, abusive lending practice okay, and strengthening some oversight of, uh, of uh, consumer uh, lending. Okay, but one key policy that the banking sector may not like will be his tax increase policy, okay, which will actually dampen, uh, you know, further dampen growth in the near term. Okay, for Trump's side, okay, uh, it will be a positive for banks okay, because uh, back in 2018, okay, the banks actually saw record profits under Trump, okay, boosted partially by his uh, uh, tax cut policies. Okay, we also see him, you know, uh, easing the vocal rule, okay, easing the restriction uh, uh, for the smaller banks to not have to undergo uh, stress tests. So in general, if you are looking at it, Trump uh, re-election uh, will be a positive, okay, for the financial uh, sector. Okay, so here is a list of ETF, okay, which investors may look out for. Uh, top few holdings will be, you know, uh, JP Morgan, Bank of America. Okay, but on a side note, right, I believe that if there is any downside overreaction on the larger banks, okay, under Biden's election, okay, I believe that it may still be a good opportunity to accumulate. Okay, rationale is that, you know, from the regulation standpoint, actually larger banks, right, they are already highly scrutinized because they are too big to fail, right? Okay. So uh, any tightening of uh, regulations in the financial sector okay, may actually have a larger impact on the smaller banks uh, instead. Okay? So I believe that you know, uh, the bad news for larger banks uh, may be uh, discounted to a certain extent. Okay, so that's my, uh, that's my personal view on it. Okay, um, JP Morgan. Okay, um, operating profits will take time to recover uh, back to pre-COVID levels. Okay, in general, if you look at the whole banking sectors, uh, they will have to grind it out. Lah, okay, beyond uh, 2022. Okay, but positive is that, uh, yes, they maintain their current dividend uh, payout level following the 2020 uh, stress test result. Okay, if you look at their loan loss reserve, uh, it's healthy. It's at 3.5% uh, of a loan book. Okay, and also um, JP Morgan, they actually has a new uh, requirement that is imposed by the Fed. Okay, which they have, which uh, for their CET1 requirement, which they have to fulfill uh, by, by October. Okay, uh, but currently for their latest quarter, uh, they have actually fulfilled it already. And also uh, they, they even fulfill it by quite a, quite a good uh, margin. Okay, so in a way, I believe that it actually signals uh, a strong uh, capital position on their end. Okay, of course, the uh, negative will be uh, the low interest rate environment, which will continue to hurt it, its uh, net interest income growth. Okay, this will actually apply for the whole uh, banking sector itself. Lah. Okay, and, uh, but currently dividend yield is at uh, 3.9%. Okay, so uh, like I mentioned, by and large, I believe that you know, for banks, it's uh, probably more of a, of a waiting game because they will actually take uh, the next few years to, to recover back to uh, pre-COVID. Okay, for uh, Bank of America, okay, uh, situation is largely similar to JP Morgan. Uh, same thing, uh, operating profits will take next few years to recover. 
Okay, um, but positive is that yes, they maintain their dividends, okay, following the stress test also. Okay, but their valuation may be more attractive compared to its peers itself. Okay, so if we look at this uh, PB ratio, it's around 0 0.84, okay, which is uh, significantly below the 10 year uh, sector average of 1.28. Okay, so of course, a negative will be that it may be more sensitive uh, to, to changes in terms of interest rate and therefore may, may actually face uh, greater challenges. Okay, if you are looking now at a current uh, low interest rate environment whereby, you know, rates are expected to remain low until uh, at least 2023, okay, based on uh, the Fed's projection. Okay, uh, material sectors, uh, fundamentals is that it is largely uh, cyclical. Okay, of course, if you are looking at accommodative uh, monetary and fiscal policy, it may actually improve uh, uh, prospect for global economic growth. Okay, and uh, but the pace of economic recovery remains uh, highly uncertain. Uh, therefore, I'm, I'm being neutral uh, about this. Okay, and uh, of course, if you are looking at both parties, right, um, both have an infrastructure bill, okay, that is leaning towards, uh, uh, like for Biden, he's looking at a highway transit, uh, green energy, okay, for Trump, he's also looking for an infrastructure bill on uh, roads, okay, bridges and uh, public transport. Okay, uh, if you are looking at extensive uh, investment in rebuilding, uh, roads and bridges, right? You may be looking at higher demand for materials such as uh, asphalt and concrete. So asphalt is what you use to, to build a road. Okay, so uh, Valkin, okay, is one of the S&P 500 companies. Okay, they do provide these, uh, these uh, materials. Okay, positive are that uh, public sector construction accounts for um, half, around half of its total shipment. And uh, if you are looking at public project, okay, they tend to be more stable. Lah. Okay, as they are less uh, affected by uh, general economic uh, cycles. Okay, they also adapt an uh, in, inorganic strategy for expansion. Okay, they can take advantage of the current uh, low interest rate environment. Okay, however, negative will be in terms of your know, uncertainty uh, due to COVID. Okay, and we may be looking like uh, timing and amount of uh, federal funding for infrastructure may be lumpy, okay, may be, may be inconsistent also. Okay, but generally, if both parties have plans for uh, infrastructure spending, uh, Falcon may be poised to uh, benefit. Okay, uh, industrial. Okay, uh, we are looking at heightened uh, geopolitical pressure. Okay, that will actually keep defense spending in place. Okay, however, on the other side of the coin, uh, fall in travel demand will continue to weigh on the transportation industry. Okay, however, I believe, you know, a lot of negativity may have been uh, priced into the valuation. Okay, if you look at economic recovery, uh, it has continued. Okay, if, if you see there's a especially, you know, expansionary figures in terms of a PMI and a industrial production. Okay, for Biden and Trump, you know, positive may, may again come from that infrastructure uh, spending. Okay, I believe that uh, geopolitical tension will continue with both parties, with Biden being uh, tougher on Russia, okay, Trump will be tougher on China. Okay, for defense sectors, a uh, 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 stable counter may be Lockheed Martin, okay, has a strong trend of uh, security, uh, securing uh, contract from Pentagon, which in a way provides a steady inflow of uh, follow-on orders. Lah. If you look at the proposed defense budget uh, for 2021 under the US, it reflects a 3% uh, growth. Okay, so of course, we are not looking at very huge exorbitant growth, but I mean, it's kind of more, more of a slow and steady kind of thing. Okay, higher budget will then translate into uh, more orders. Uh. Okay, however, uh, COVID okay, actually caused uh, some supply part shortage for them. Okay, because their supply chain is, uh, they actually have quite a significant supply chain from overseas. Okay, and also if you are looking at uh, soaring government deficits, right, we are not too sure whether uh, in the longer term, whether they may string the, the defense budget in a sense. Okay, uh, infrastructure, uh, there is a Caterpillar, okay, they provide uh, construction equipment. Um, but for Caterpillar, they are heavily impacted from COVID, okay, when lockdown actually leads to a suspension of uh, operations. 
Okay, so they will take the next few years to, to recover. Okay, but a positive is that they are actually taking actions to, to sustain their margin by reducing uh, cost itself. Okay, they also have a growing solar energy business. Okay, uh, but currently the contribution is still uh, minimal. Lah. Okay, the downside is that order backlog actually declined uh, 8.5% okay, for its latest quarter due to a weak demand uh, from the pandemic. So if we see more, uh, more customers cancelling orders, right, it may continue to weigh on its uh, top line. Okay, uh, Infotech and comms uh, services, okay, they are direct beneficiaries from COVID. Okay, if you are looking at work from home trend and social mobility restriction. Uh, longer term wise, I mean, there is 5G, there is Internet of Things, and we are looking at automated uh, technology. Okay, however, both Biden and Trump, they, they do share a common stand in terms of uh, anti-competitive uh, business practice. Okay, partially because, you know, general public wants to counterbalance uh, the industry's uh, growing market power, right? And under Biden, a uh, corporate tax increase may have a larger impact on the sector earnings of around 10%, okay, as compared to the other uh, sector itself. Then for Trump, you know, uh, he, if you want to maintain uh, scrutiny and uh, having a uh, customer as uh, having Chinese ads in terms of customer may be at risk. Okay, uh, however, the main thing is that, you know, uh, I believe that it will be very difficult for them to actually translate into actual policy itself. Okay, uh, but I do still like Facebook. Okay, if you look at the, the diagram, it's top and bottom line is projected to grow uh, consistently. Okay, they are also making investment to expand their footprint in India. Okay, which actually carries their largest uh, user base currently okay, and have a lot of uh, monetization uh, potential. Okay, the negative will be that there is cutthroat competition in the online advertising space. Okay, if you are looking at Amazon and Google. Okay, however, you know, with all this competition, Facebook is actually able to display a resilience as shown from its uh, consistent growth in uh, daily active users. Okay. So the Google, Facebook, Amazon, they actually dominate around 60% of US online advertising business. So I think the key risk will be more for the smaller players who are actually facing challenges uh, grabbing market share. Okay, lastly for healthcare sectors, okay, uh, companies within the biotech and pharma industry, okay, they stand to benefit if they produce you know, tests and vaccines for COVID-19. Okay, longer term growth will be in terms of population demographic. Okay, if you are looking at aging uh, global population, also a growing middle class in an emerging uh, market. Okay, both parties, they want to lower out of pocket costs, healthcare costs for Americans. They are looking at lowering, uh, targeting uh, drug pricing. Okay, however, Biden is more likely to, to make it happen. Okay, because for Trump, he has started a policy efforts okay, to lower prescription drug pricing in his term, but uh, it doesn't seem to hardly have any uh, visible uh, results in a way. Okay, so uh, Thermo Fisher is a S&P 500 company. Okay, may be positive in the Biden win. Okay, rationale is because uh, China is its largest market outside of US. Okay, and the Biden win means we may see lesser trade tension. So they can continue with their plans to strengthen foothold in uh, emerging markets. So they are a life science company. Okay, they are able to tap on the COVID situation. So uh, they are also ramping up production for their COVID-19 test, okay, to meet a growing uh, global demand. Okay, but the negative will be that their core business, okay, uh, are still impacted by COVID, okay, because they make scientific instrument with, uh, you know, big ticket size, and it's a non-life sustaining in nature. So in a, in a crisis like this, uh, their growth, uh, could potentially uh, moderate if their customers are not doing well. Okay, um, for Trump win, uh, Vertex is another S&P uh, 500 company. Okay, the rationale is that Democrats are more likely, you know, to get lowering uh, drug pricing over the finishing line. Okay, so they are actually a first company to develop a drug for the condition called uh, cystic uh, fibrosis. Okay, that is actually a life-threatening disease that affects the lung and the, and the digestive system. Okay, but because of that, okay, they are able to have strong pricing power for their, for their drug itself. And they actually charge a very uh, high price. Okay, so previously, they actually faced issues you know, of uh, low-income patients uh, unable to, to afford. 
Okay, and I believe that it could be under greater scrutiny with your Biden presidency. Okay, so positive are that they are actively sourcing for inorganic growth to broaden its product. Okay, beyond just, you know, uh, riding on this uh, cystic fibrosis franchise. Okay, and the current low interest rate environment may, may be a benefit for them. Okay, if they are looking at a potential uh, acquisition okay, for their pro product uh, pipeline. Okay, um, but negative will be uh, currently they are still being dependent on this uh, CF franchise, okay, the cystic fibrosis, and there is some form of uh, concentration risk. Okay, and also other major players, they, may also, they are also trying to come up with uh, drugs to, to tap on this market. So in the event, if they are successful, okay, uh, I think they can potentially uh, snatch uh, market share uh, away from uh, Vertex. Okay, so these are just some trading ideas that uh, you may want to watch out for. Okay, if you all you you want to go for a US uh, election play itself. Okay, so uh, with that, I've come to the end of the presentation. Okay, um, I will take a look at the question. So uh, please, bear for a moment. Uh, please bear with me for a moment. Okay, I, I do see Okay, I do see a lot of uh, individual uh, counter asking about other individual uh, counter. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions. Okay, for individual counters, uh, okay, please uh, bear with me. I'm, I'm unable to give my uh, thoughts here first. I mean, because uh, I believe that you know, if I want to to really recommend, uh, I need I need to properly show you the the goods and bad and also the charge, right? Okay, uh, one question is view on US uh, technology stocks and any correction expected. Um, currently, uh, I believe that, you know, the whole market is very, uh, will be very news focused in the short term. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I believe the, the whole market will be very news focused in the short term because with this uh, uh, Trump suddenly contracting uh, COVID-19, right? So you can see that there may be a lot of panic selling because we, the key risk is we do not know how a uh, Trump condition will proceed. You know, uh, even doctors may not be sure how, how whether he, he can even uh, take part in the election itself. Okay, so I believe that, you know, market is very volatile now. Okay, which will in a way also uh, uh, bring down uh, US technology stocks. Okay, but ultimately I believe that, you know, when price really drops, Okay, and the market has stabilized with after all this uh, uncertainty. Okay, I do believe that it's actually a good, uh, good uh, opportunity to accumulate. Okay, we can adopt a barbell strategy, right? So on one side, you have all this uh, COVID play, which is all your technology stock. Okay, and also all the uh, comm service. And on the other hand, you could have a reopening play. Okay, why we go for reopening play? Uh, my, my main focus is on the valuation. Okay, because they have been punished uh, uh, quite badly from this COVID and especially with this, uh, with this uh, Trump situation itself. Okay, um, see one that is a US trend for rest of 2020. Um, like I mentioned, it will be news focus. Okay, volatility will stay until past election. Even if past election, if you are looking at the risk of a contested election, Okay, we will be seeing, uh, my personal take is that we will be seeing a market correction, okay, like what we have seen in uh, year 20, uh, 2000 itself. Okay, so I believe that uh, for this year, it will be very highly uncertain. We may be seeing a, a downwards uh, revision, but going into next year, I'm still uh, bullish. Okay, if you are looking at uh, economic recovery, okay, if you are looking at a potential uh, a COVID being in play. Yeah, so this is my, uh, my current take on this. Okay, let me see, uh, probably I have time for, for, for some other question. Oh, got one asked, what if Trump refused to leave office? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yes, he did say that he, 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 will, he do not want to uh, leave office if he lose, right? Okay, uh, what is the fallout? Okay, I believe that um, if he do not want to leave office, okay, he will have to bring out uh, certain uh, 
this will be the scenario whereby we are looking at a delayed election result because he may try to contest okay like maybe some states like maybe florida he may try to contest that oh uh, you know voting mail-in mail-in voting is not fair i think he will go for from that direction itself like he always has been okay so he will try to bring out some issue okay to to actually delay the election result and of course uh, likewise that brings back to the point that if you are looking at a delayed election there is a greater uncertainty in your market Okay, back in 2000, market retraced 12%. Okay, so I may expect, you know, a market correction in that sense, considering that, you know, uh, yeah, economic recovery is in place now. We need a stable uh, uh, government to actually have a proper, uh, like maybe plan for further fiscal stimulus. So any delay, um, I will expect to, to have a downside. Okay. And... Yeah, so sorry for individual counters. Uh, I, I will not state, state my view here. And let me see. Has the market price in the Biden read? Okay, uh, okay, due to time constraint, this will be the last question. Okay, has the market price in the Biden win? Okay, I believe that currently, uh, yes, sell down due to uncertainty, but when the market really uh, pick up pace, okay, it may extend towards, uh, I would say, a more K shaped recovery. Okay, in terms of uh, market may be starting to, to price in a Biden win already. Okay, because even before um even before the, the Trump getting COVID, right? If you look at all the clean energy ETF, right, they have already started to, to pick up pace already. Okay, because market has already, you know, starting to, to price in that Biden will win. Okay, so uh in the event that you know once we get uh, nearer and nearer to the election, okay, if the approval rating does not improve. Okay, does not improve uh, for Trump, right? Okay, then uh, yes, I believe that after this sell down, the recovery will be in a K shape. Okay, with a uh, with a higher recovery pricing in uh, for a Biden win. Okay, but if you are going for long term, right? Like I mentioned, you know, um, try try. I I will, I will believe not to jump in just based on the U.S. election because I believe that you know after everyone having the exuberance on a Biden win, right? Suddenly they will realize that. Hey, Actually, uh, yes, he's trying to push ahead with, you know, like maybe clean technology, but all these fiscal stimulus still have to be passed. Okay, have to go through Congress. Okay, then it ultimately depends on whether it's a, a split Congress or a, or, a, or a unified Congress. And also it may be looking at a reduced budget, all these kind of things. So, short term, uh, short term wise, you know, I mean, even for US election, no problem, you can go for a short term trade. But if you go for a longer term one, you may have to be careful on all these, uh, or this uncertainty itself. Lah. Yeah, so sorry, uh, my time is up. I mean, uh, I hope you all learned something from this. Uh, if there's any question, I mean, you can post it on the on the Stocks BNB community, community page. Uh, so sorry to do to, to, to this. Uh, now I pass on the time uh, to him for Hong Kong Outlook. Uh, okay.